Hello, um, welcome to a, another Clear Mountain uh, Monastery interview. Today we're blessed with the presence of Aya Brahmavara, who will be popping up as we move around the boxes on our screen. There we go. Aya, thank you so much for, for coming and being with us. Thank you so much for inviting me, Venerables. Um, Aya Brahmavara uh, learned Vipassana meditation from age 24 under the guidance of Goenka. After hearing about meditation retreats from a fellow student at Sheffield University, uh, from being a medic striving to alleviate suffering, there was a gradual realignment over the next 10 years from the medical field of practice to the monastic one. Same quest going deeper. As she discovered in the Buddha's path of practice how one could begin to explore and to help alleviate suffering through facing up to its root causes. I have visited Amravati Monastery with a couple of Gwenka friends in 1999, and by the end of 2000 was working as retreat center manager there. In August 2001, she was glad to have the chance to renounce the household life and enter monastic life as an Anagarika. Sila Dara Pabaja followed in 2004, and she practiced at Amravati and Chittar's monasteries in the UK for the next 15 years. I have benefited from many months on Tudong in the UK, Ireland, Italy, and France, and from pilgrimages to Burma, India, Taiwan, China, and Malaysia, which increased her faith in the Samana life and broadened her view of Buddhist practice. In 2019, Aya Brahmavara moved to Thailand and Wat Subtawi to practice under the guidance of Lung Por Ganha. From him, she learned the value of sacrifice, of selfless service, and of love. Aya Niroda is a valued bhikkhuni there, and she encouraged Aya Brahmavara to consider full ordination as a bhikkhuni. In 2021, Aya feels blessed to have been invited to receive bhikkhuni upasampada with Mahateri Aya Tataloka as preceptor, and joined the auspicious Vasa gathering at Damadrini Monastery in Aranya Bodhi Hermitage. Aya Brahmavara's aspiration is to continue the practice using this form as a way of serving and supporting liberation from suffering for all beings. So that's quite a bio, and uh, we're grateful for all, all it entails, Aya. <laughs> Is there anything we missed or that you'd add on since it was written? Uh, well, I got myself ordained as a bikini last year, uh, last September, and um, I've been traveling here and there since then, and I'm actually back at Damodarani Monastery for the Vasa this year. Okay. Congratulations on full ordination then. Thank you. Um, one thing I, uh, we just spoken before I would, we have lots of questions for you. Um, just to pick up though, on a conversation we were having right before we began um, uh, recording was we were speaking about how disparate elements seem to come together around projects and, and certain teachings. And I, I really have been struck by, um, you know, up here with, um, the sutta based teachings and such, there seems to be an ability to bring together people from kind of all walks of life and Dharma practice around that sort of core. Um, and I'm curious, yeah, how that echoes your own experience or your own path to, um, this sort of core monastic form for yourself. Um, it's a broad question, but I didn't know what that brought up for you. Thank you so much. <clears throat> yeah, I really appreciate that uh, beginning question. Um, because, yeah, for me, the uh, Buddha's teachings in the Pali Canon have kind of really informed my monastic life. And uh, they're really the background of all the teaching that I'm able to offer. And uh, I also, like you, really noticed that um, they speak to the heart of people from all different backgrounds and, you know, traditions and cultures and how beautiful that is. And uh, I'm really kind of celebrating these days how, you know, we, we get to teach a lot online and connect mm. with people, you know, globally and uh, even more of an outreach in that way. Uh, even more accessible. And so it's like, you know, <laughs> like the golden age of Buddhism has arrived, you know, because people can really access these teachings so easily now, at least if they have the resources, you know, to be able to get online and have devices that can connect, um, you know, and that's that's a wonderful thing. It's a really beneficial 
um, aspect of our current time that we live in. So, yeah, and I, I've been traveling to different places and practicing in different settings and just appreciating that uh, there is this opportunity to connect and to offer teachings and that people are able to, you know, access them without too much difficulty. And of course, you know, the teachings of the Buddha being universal truths and universal guidance, it kind of, it does bring people together um, in the Dharma. Uh, we're all, you know, subject to the same vicissitudes of life and we have the same issues really. And people are seeking happiness in all the different ways that they understand they can find happiness. And, um, you know, it gives me a lot of joy that uh, the teachings of the Buddha are actually offering a clear way to really reach the highest happiness. Um, what a joy. What a joy to be able to share the Dharma with others. Yeah. When you speak about, um, you know, the universal appeal of the teachings and how they kind of bridge all these boundaries of form and identity, um, and yet the form seems to have been a constant journey for you in mm -hmm. terms of your deepening practice from, you know, lay woman, lay practitioner to uh, Siladara to Bhikkhuni. And I'm curious what, what drew you through those different iterations and what have you found the, what reflections have arisen out of each transition or each moment of, you know, transition. Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, it's been quite an interesting journey for me in a sense. Um, it, it kind of uh, unusual maybe in some ways, the trajectory that I've had. Um, but in a way, it's almost a bit like, a, it's a bit like, you know, shooting an arrow and the arrow is just moving in a certain direction. So in, in another sense, paradoxically, it's been very, straightforward you know but we have these different forms and you know modes of practice and um i started off as a goenka student so i was for many many years like 15 years or so i was practicing as a lay person um and my entry point into the buddhist teachings was through meditation practice vipassana meditation and so i just followed that uh, very happily, very clearly for a long time. And then, you know, somebody, uh, a friend of mine, um, suggested that we visit a Buddhist monastery. And that was quite a, uh, interesting for me. It was a bit of a revelation mm -hmm. to discover that there were Buddhist monasteries, um, even in my own country. And not only that, but when I did uh, visit Amaravati for the first time in 99, I saw all these nuns. <laughs> and uh, I remember, you know, very quickly seeing the nuns and feeling the inspiration of the, it was a big gathering, you know, for the meal, Dharma. And we brought some food and we offered the food and like we heard the blessing chant. And the whole thing was extremely powerful for me, very moving experience and it just occurred to me oh my goodness you know if I wanted to live as a monastic like practice you know 24-7 uh, this is a possibility hmm. wow and I was spending a lot of time in Goenka centers so I was more or less living in the centers and serving and sitting courses but, you know, the Goenka organization, it's primarily, it's a lay organization. And so it was really quite new to me, this possibility. Um, and then within a very short time, you know, I uh, kind of moved into the monastery uh, as a retreat center manager. And uh, I, I, I wanted to ordain from the start of my uh, visits to Amravati, but it took time, of course which was actually very difficult for me because I, I couldn't understand that. I just thought, well, why can't I just ordain? I'm ready to ordain. <laughs> why don't you just ordain me? So I was very impatient. 
I had to learn many, many, many things, but one of them was patience. And uh, yeah, so then the, the form that was available, you know, was the Anagarika form and then leading on to the Siladra ordination. So I followed through and just continued practicing as a Siladra for, yeah, like 15, 16 years. And um, started learning about the kind of different possibilities for monks and nuns, different forms in which we can practice, the history of the tradition, why the monks had full ordination and the nuns didn't, and so on. And, you know, I was following the Bhikkhuni revival with great interest and found it very uplifting and inspiring, you know, to hear about Bhikkhuni ordinations happening again. And, uh, you know, my heart inclined, of course, towards uh, taking full ordination and following the vinya that was laid down by the Buddha for women practitioners who have the aspiration, you know, to fully ordain. And, uh, it, you know, causes and conditions kind of slowly but surely uh, led to my uh, seeking bhikkhuni ordination um, back in 2019. And uh, so again, my fo I changed forms again, in a way, almost like changing lineage to some extent, because I was moving away from the Thai forest tradition into something rather broader and more global, the bhikkhuni sangha. Uh, feels like a global community and uh, very broad and very eclectic, you know, and uh, like a big expansion somehow for me as a Siladra to step into this realm. And I, I feel really like grateful and uh, hugely benefited from the transition. So that's just a, a short answer. Well, not so short, but that's what's <laughs> mine. <laughs> I, yeah, thank you very much. Um, maybe just to, to zoom in into one particular shift in your project trajectory when you went from lay clothes to when you, you know, basically practicing in the, the Goenka tradition into, into the monastery. Uh, this is something I had a similar transition. I know a lot of people, I mean, these days at um, quite a few of our monasteries around the world, like you could even say the majority of aspirants for um, uh, bhikkhu or and maybe even bhikkhuni ordination in these different um, specifically Ajahn Cha branch monasteries are people who are very intent on living like a Goenka life like you were doing and I was on that path I know many others and I'm curious if you could speak to um, yeah how that went for you did you find it was a, a smooth transition from uh, the teachings and the methods and the technique you were using in the Goenka tradition into this uh, broader mode of, of practice that is, is practiced in the Ajahn Chah monasteries as you, as you lived it? Thank you, um, Ajahn. Yeah, actually it was very difficult. I found it quite challenging to transition from the Goenka way of practice to the monastic way. Um, yeah, I, I realized actually that uh, we can become conditioned as meditators, you know, we can get conditioned in, <laughs> in almost every aspect of life. And certainly as a meditator, as a Goenka practitioner, I, I had really taken on board, you know, kind of, this is the way that we practice. And as, a, you know, part of the Goenka tradition, maybe one of its strengths is that it's very clear about technique and there's not really much encouragement to experiment or to broaden the way of practice, um, just follow the simple technique and it's a great technique for sure um, and definitely good enough. But I had a quite a narrow mindset in a way because coming into the monastery people were talking about practicing in all different ways. And I found that quite difficult. I, I was quite closed to other possibilities and ways of contemplating the Dharma and even practicing meditation. So I, I had to deconstruct quite a lot. Uh, it felt a bit like going from um, like a high school 
to something more like a university where suddenly you know <laughs> the 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 possibilities were just so so much greater um and i found that confusing uh, and but you know i did learn gradually and let go of uh, quite a lot of conditioning which i was better off without and um you know i was very resistant to things like um having to spend a lot of time not meditating. <laughs> yeah, I thought, you know, I've come into this life, I've given everything up, I've renounced the world, I'm here to meditate. Um, and people say, oh no, we've got work every every morning, you know. <clears throat> and I'd say, well, no, I'm not here to work. <laughs> <laughs> I'd say it inside myself, and sometimes I'd even say it out loud. Um, not, you know, it didn't go down very well. <laughs> <laughs> and so I had to learn, yeah, again, to let go of my thoughts and I listen also mm. had to go. <laughs> and, you know, that was all very good. Um, I remember a talk once by a very wonderful monk called uh, Jan Ariasilo, the Tamravati. Mm. He spoke about how the holy life is <clears throat> really just one disillusionment after another. And that really spoke to my heart. Mm -hmm. And I, I don't think, you know, as he was saying, this is not a bad thing. This is actually a positive and wholesome thing because disillusionment is the path, <laughs> you know, and uh, <laughs> to have all one's ideas and thoughts and, you know, one sense of the future trajectory, to have all that shattered is very mm -hmm. helpful and uh, to keep letting things dissolve and, giving up the views and recognizing that, you know, things are always other than that. Mm. The, the ideas and um, thoughts we have about even the goal of the path, it's always going to be other than that. So this is this was really helpful for me to open up to this gradually. But it was tough. And I really felt like it was a, a, more of a change of lineage than any step I've taken since then. That was the big shift for me, was moving from the lay goenka lifestyle, which was so monastic in many ways, but moving from that into uh, living as a monastic, I was, it was a big change of lineage for me. That's how it felt. And Aya, what, um, what's your relationship now? You mentioned that, that you felt really uh, you know, a kinship or a relationship with the technique and praising the technique itself. Do you still incorporate aspects or practice it uh, exactly as it was taught? Or how has your practice of that technique evolved or, or changed? Or how, does it, uh, how do you relate to it now? Yeah, thank you, uh, Ajahn. Yeah, um, well, I you know, actually found, interestingly, that when I was practicing the Goenka, uh, technique in the Goenka setting, the um, Goenka centers. Um, I, I did a lot of long courses and got really kind of immersed in this technique. But at a certain point, um, about a year before I moved into the monastery, um, something shifted for me. So the way I was following the practice of scanning the body um, so Goenka teaches to practice Anapanasati, watching the breath for about a third of each 10-day course. And then for the next two thirds of the time of the course, seven days or so, to actually pay attention to the body by very meticulously scanning the body from head to toes and back again. So this is, this is the way that one practices on a Goenka course. And on the long courses, it's the very same kind of proportions of time that one spends with Anapanasati at the beginning and then Vipassana for about two thirds of the time. And uh, what happened for me was I was noticing that um, <laughs> there was a kind of spillover in, in both ways. So I'd be practicing Anapanasati, really, you know, seriously, religiously trying to follow the teaching and the technique. And what was happening for me was that I was uh, finding that body awareness would come in. So I was observing rather than a little point mm. um, in, on the body, observing the breath in one particular place. I was actually observing the breath 
the whole body breathing. And um, when I was doing the Vipassana aspect of the technique, uh, I, I wanted to stay with the breath. The breath became much more predominant. So I actually felt that I wasn't quite able to follow the technique. Um, and what happened then was my um, the Anapanasati became very predominant. And it was really rather more like the Anapanasati Sutta. My mind mm. was just going into <laughs> following, you know, these 16 steps almost without. Um, when I when I first read that Sutta, it was like a revelation because it's <laughs> like, oh, that's yes. You know, that's what kind of uh, experience I've had. And so I was veering away, in short, from practicing the technique into more emphasis on Anapanasati, but in a different way. And, you know, getting into the jhana practice. And I wasn't really able to get um, the opportunity to discuss with other people what was happening for me in the practice because it wasn't really welcome. It's more like you just need to follow this technique and anything that's not to do with the technique, you just need to drop it. Um, so I, I began to, I think, um, I began to move away before I actually left <laughs> the Goenka way of practice. And it's very interesting to me that it was, it was almost like that's where it started. That's where the movement started. The movement towards the next step on the path came from within, really, because I knew that I needed to discuss my practice, but I couldn't discuss my practice with um, the people around me. Um, yeah, so I'm not sure if that really answers your question. <laughs> that's, what's, that's what's come to me to say. Thank you, Al. Yeah. I have uh, so many questions. Uh... <laughs> One just came from what Ajahn Kovilo asked and kind of pushed my others out of the way for a second. And I'm really curious. I mean, the Anapanasati Sutta, mindfulness of breathing is, I've had a similar relationship with it where, you know, you read it and you realize there's this map for everything you're experiencing. And uh, it's, it's just like connecting the dots um, and quite a revelation every time. I'm curious now how you conceive of um, you know, those key steps from step number three up through, I mean, it's a huge topic, but, but what <laughs> do you, how do you see, and, you know, cause there's different interpretations of what it means to be aware of the whole breath body or the body, um, and, and then move through rapture and sukha, which is pleasure, etc. cetera. Um, just defining these terms for others, listeners, uh, how do you tend to teach those steps, um, and tetrads in, you know, five minutes, <laughs> if you had to. <laughs> yeah. Or any re relevant, relevant <laughs> threads you can pick out there that won't, you know, that you feel are approachable in this context. I'll be very interested. Yeah, thank you very much, Venerable. Yeah, I, <clears throat> I don't tend to teach um, necessarily uh, um, the 16 steps, um, but... I do um, like to bring in uh, the relationship between the Anapanasati and the Four Satipatthanas because I find that's really um, relatable for people wherever they're at, whatever stage they're at in their practice, that they can bring in, they can consider, you know, the awareness of the body, uh, awareness of the feeling in the body, awareness of the state of mind and awareness of the thinking process, the mental processes that may be going on in the course of a meditation session. You know, these things will tend to kind of uh, come into awareness. And so to, to uh, give people um, the kind of full picture of what may be experienced while watching the breath, while observing the breath. And um, it's always a bit, challenging isn't it to talk about um you know bliss and rapture and so forth and to talk about jhana practice because um it can be uh, off-putting for people if they're not experiencing anything like that if actually their experience is one of 
struggle, physical pain, restlessness, the hindrances coming and going. So I find it quite a delicate um, area. Uh, and so when I'm kind of teaching meditation, I try and keep it really simple uh, and let people have the experiences that they have. Because in my own experience, that's really what happened for me was I didn't, I didn't know um, many of the teachings of the Buddha. Um, I had very limited knowledge of the suttas um, for many years. I'm just meditating. But what I, what I really needed was to be able to discuss the experiences I was having with somebody who could give me some guidance. And that kind of one-to-one -one relationship, you know, worked really well. And uh, I feel, you know, that reading the suttas, particularly Satipatthana Sutta and Anapanasati Sutta, um, those two particularly, that they they really do offer a really helpful framework, really good guidance. And for most people, their experience is not always, it's not always easy to slot one's experience into those teachings, you know. <laughs> so so I, I tend not to, yeah, stick so much. When talking about meditation, it's keep I keep it more simple. But when doing sutta study, you know, then, uh, going through these suttas can be extremely helpful and uh, always you know to take the chance to uh, try to uh, kind of find out how the suttas can come to life for each one of us what they can mean for each one of us and I, I don't know about you but I notice that almost every time I read a sutta even if it's only a few weeks or a few days from the last time that I read it, there will be something different coming up. There'll be some aspect that's, you know, striking me in a different way or, or, or a piece of it that's really meaningful this time that didn't really stand out for me last time and so forth. So this is a really wonderful thing about, yeah, trying to, you know, work with the relationship between what's taken in intellectually through the voice, through the reading, and what's actually happening mm -hmm. in our meditation practice. It's a very rich field, isn't it? Thank you, Ayat.